Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. And welcome to episode 356 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers here with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hi, Sarah. Before we start recording this, uh, I just have to say that I hear birds chirping in the background. Oh my gosh! Is at it your house. <laughs> and I don't know if it'll come through into like into the episode itself, yeah. but I'm so jealous because we it's March and we're just in Michigan, not quite at like raucous birds chirping outside the window just yet. And it's such you know an auditory I mean? cue, I'm sure, for you that like it's, it it, uh, oh. it does that like it brings up spring in your whole body, like your yes. whole sensory awareness. Yeah. Yes. I feel like I just like I leaned forward a little bit because we're so close. We're so close. And some days, like if it's sunny, they'll all hear them outside and then they just kind of go quiet again. So we're I'm in like, the silent eh, spring right now. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, we would all like to be on a tropical vacation now, wouldn't we? I bet we would. <laughs> Okay, well, listeners, you probably have realized we're leaning in on some travel episodes uh, this month. Not forever. We'll we'll be sure to mix in some non-travel stuff, too. But on Sunday, Megan, you and I talked about solo travel, which was really fun, Uh. like kind of fantasized about getting back out there on airplanes and traveling by ourselves. So today we're doing like a like reverse course. (laughs) We are talking about family travel um, a lot, especially with little kids. Um, But of course, the right thing to do is to tap into the wisdom of our community because seven years into this podcast, we are coming up on our seven year anniversary We've kind of shared everything, all of our own tips on family we're done. travel. You can look Turns that up out, in the archives. <laughs> we had Nothing a few left. good ideas. We had a few yep. good tips in us. Um, so today we have the best family travel advice that our community had to offer in the form of little tips and hacks and nuggets. And they're so, so good. And I just have a couple things to say here before we get going. First of all, I, I'm thinking a lot about two years of COVID because it's that time, you know, this is like the week two years ago that everything shut down. And I remembered that on March 10th of 2020, we aired an episode called Planning Travel and Family Vacations Part One. The part one being ever so optimistic, I guess. When we recorded it, we didn't didn't even know anything would have happened because it would have been like a week prior to March 10th. By the time it aired, it was March 10th. And by the time we went to record part two, we're like, uh, I don't think we should do this. Yeah. Um, it almost even feels weird now talking about it because like it's time, right? It, either people are going on road trips or they're finally like planning that travel that two years ago we had to just like ixnay and pretend didn't exist for a while. Yeah. But there's still a lot of people who aren't. And it's like and for people like me, like sometimes I'm taken by surprise by changes. I'm like, oh, wait, we can do that now. And then I feel like I'm behind. Yeah. So um yeah, I could see myself being in that situation where like I've got a bunch of little kids in the house and I'm looking around going, oh, people are doing this again. Oh, boy. Whoops. Yeah. I kind of missed the missed the 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 memo on this one. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's good to return to this this kind of content wherever you are in your returning to travel journey. And and as we talked about on Sunday, you and I both did some travel in 2021 in some of like the lighter covid months. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of people have traveled a bit in the last two years, but. Here's hoping that this spring and summer, there's even more safe opportunities for people to travel. Um, It was really fun reading through these tips because there were so many recurring themes that I wanted to like alternate title this episode, like (laughs) an ode to Ziploc bags, laundry baskets, painters tape and the Target dollar section. Like it's kind of like these things kept coming up and um, (laughs) we're going to get into the smart tips. But it it did remind me that I mostly flew when I had really young kids which is a different animal and requires a bunch of different tips and hacks. But the road trip tips, especially about ke- where to keep stuff in the car and how to stay organized, I'm uh, reading through them. I'm, my mind is blown because there's so many th- there's so many things you can do differently when you're packing up a car. And I know that's the right. reality for a lot of people's travel this spring. So, yeah, just as a reminder, we did do an episode in wow June of 2021. I can't believe it was that long ago yeah. where it was house rules for travel um, for family travel. And that was like, that was more parenting advice, really. That was things like um, screen time or snacks and treats or like, how does everyone sleep when you're on the road or dealing with like um, 
the gimmies and whininess, things like that. And this isn't really as much parenting advice. Um, it's more like what, like literally how to deal with your stuff, how to get things from point A to point B. More like, um, more hacks really yeah. than parenting advice. Yeah. yeah. And if you missed that house rules episode, I think it would pair perfectly with that one. Cause yeah, like you said, that one has stuff about like how to keep kids from fighting in the car or like it's yeah. much more about the parenting advice. And today is much more about literally like, how do we get there? Where do we put right. all the stuff? How right. do we make this go smoothly? More logistical. Yeah, absolutely. So to that end, we have four sections today. We're going to work through and share all your great tips. We're going to talk about what to bring. We're going to talk about where to put it, the stuff, and also where to put the people. Um, we're going to talk about like general efficiency tips, stuff you can do ahead that you're just so thankful for later. We had some great ones there. And then just general mindset shifts, because as we know, like half the battle is just reframing what you're what you expect on these family trips um, so that you can enjoy yourself and maybe adjust expectations or reframe things for yourself and for your kids and your family. So, Megan, I was just looking at some analytics on the most popular blog posts on the momhour.com. Do you have any guesses what they are? Uh, Sarah, I am. I am stumped. Tell me. OK, well, I was laughing because two of the most popular blog posts are about flying on airplanes with babies and toddlers. And then right beneath that was another one about how to keep kids entertained on long road trips. So I'm guessing moms in our community might have some uh, travel coming up. <laughs> So a few other posts getting a lot of traffic. There's one I wrote about how to plan activities and structure your days at home with little kids. Another one about getting kids ready for kindergarten and a breastfeeding product guide. It's almost like we can see what questions and challenges moms are having just by looking at these blog post analytics. I love it. And Sarah, I know that most of our listeners find us through the podcast first. That's definitely the core of our business. But I do hope people check out the blog, too, because some topics really just work well in an article. And we have so many talented writers on our team who share their expertise on everything from gift guides to potty training tips. So the best way not to miss a blog post is actually to sign up for our email newsletter. We don't spam you with tons of email, but we send a really concise digest every two weeks with the posts you might enjoy on the blog. Click the link in the show notes now to sign up or head to themomhour.com slash news. Megan, we love hearing from our listeners who say they feel like they know us and we're their friends because the sentiment really does go both ways. And for our friends who want to share their love for the show, we have a shop. Yes, it's true. If you go to themomhour.com and click on shop in the top bar, you'll find shirts, mugs, and even the cutest little onesies for sale. And we know that some of you got or gave the Mom Hour merch at the holidays. So if you do own any of our gear, we would love to see a picture of you. Go ahead and post a picture on social media and tag us in it. We'd love it. Oh, yeah, that would be so fun to see. And I love thinking of us all over the country and the world drinking out of our Mom Hour mugs. So, again, you can find that link right on the homepage of our website at themomhour.com or go directly to themomhour.com slash shop. All right, diving in with our listeners' best advice uh, in the general category of what to bring for family travel First, I'm just going to go over some things that were mentioned over and over and over again. And that just means they're tried and true. So we won't go individually of who said this because so many of you mentioned more snacks than you think you need <laughs> and snacks that are exciting and novel exactly. to the kids. They yeah. have to be fun snacks. Fun snacks. You know, that's like a rule. Yep. Mm -hmm. And more than you think. Um, dollar store toys and activities for the novelty. I mean, the number of mentions of the Target dollar section or going to the dollar store the key being novelty, things you can pull out of a bag or a bin and be like, wow, look at this. Um, changes of clothes for everyone came up again and again. Uh, white noise machines and baby monitors came up again and again. Don't forget those. Um, and then this one just made me laugh. Megan, do you even know what water wow, what those little things are? Because they didn't come out. They came out when Violet was like a toddler or preschooler. I gave you I, a link. I'm looking at them now and I know I don't remember specifically Melissa and Doug's water wow. But there since very since we were little, there have been something like that. Like, remember the little the write on things that you'd get like at the truck stops and they would have like a little pen that was basically just water and you would scribble on the paper and then like a, a drawing would come out. Um, Kind of. But did those disappear and you could do it again? No, that yeah. I think is the difference. I think yeah. that was like one and done. Yeah. yeah. So water. Wow. And, and I did think it would be funny to like bring this up because all of our listeners are like, oh yeah, water wow is the most go-to travel toy because 
It could be reused again and again. You fill the little pen with water and there's no mess and they're they're great and they're not very expensive. And the pages are like kind of thick cardboard. So they they'll last for multiple times. Um, but I remember when these came out and it was when my youngest was, I don't know, preschool age or something. So I knew they hadn't been around forever. And the, the number of times they came up in this uh, call for call for advice was staggering. So there you go. Well, and it's also bringing up in my mind something that I'm not sure if it's around anymore, but it was like a almost looks like a tablet with a little attached pencil. Oh, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. you the just stretch, press the, on magna doodles. Oh, magna magna doodle. Yeah. That's a magna doodle. Yeah, you're right. And it's like white. But then when you press yes. on it, it draws and then you shake it or something and it you goes sh- away. Or, there's, or you slide a little eraser slide, back and forth. Mm-hmm. I think I'm messing that up with an Etch-a-Sketch. Right. The shaking is Etch-a-Sketch. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. And all those are good. Everybody loves the water wow. Um, so you're welcome, Melissa and Doug. A little bit of free free advertising. For those of you maybe who have really like babies and you haven't gotten there yet, you're welcome. Um, okay. So moving on, Megan, why don't you shout out uh, our first specific recommendation for what to pack? Okay, so Sherry says, I always pack a freezer bag with over-the-counter medication that might be needed. So Motrin, Tylenol, Benadryl, cortisone cream for bug bites, et cetera. So all of the things. Basically, like, sounds almost like an on-the-go first aid kit plus some, you know? And she says, um, you might not need it, but if you do, it's so nice not to have to make a special trip to the store. And isn't it funny how the thing you might even look at, glance at, and think, I won't need that, and, like, put it back is, like, always the one thing. yeah. That it turns out that you wish you would have brought. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Especially um, with spring and summer travel. Sometimes you're doing outdoorsy things you haven't done in like a year or maybe you've never done. So I I live in a place that doesn't do a lot of bug bites. We just don't have a lot of bugs and bug bites. And then we travel somewhere and I'm like, oh, my gosh. So just remember, too, it's not just the health and safety stuff you deal with at home, but potentially things you don't deal with. So, yeah, exciting and new health conditions. Exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, Sarah says. For any nighttime driving, glow sticks from the dollar store keep everyone happy for a while. So that is so smart. And I seriously think that my 13 and 11 year old would be very happy with a glow stick while driving in the dark. So I love that one. I do too. Okay. So this one is so genius. Um, And I guess this is where the painter's tape (laughs) comment came from, Sarah. I literally never would have thought to do this. But Laura says, pack contractor grade garbage bags and painter's tape for instant blackout curtains. That's like, that's like taking, you know, travel hacks to the genius degree. It is. And it's a good reminder that like, sometimes I don't think outside the box of what could fit in your suitcase, just because something is a little off the beaten path. If it's small and folds up easily, why not? Right? Like garbage bags weigh nothing. And painter's tape isn't going to take up that much space. You could nestle it in there with the socks. Um, So I love that idea. Instant blackout curtains. Allison says, when flying, pack a spare set of clothes for mom as well as baby in your carry on. So now lots of people, lots of people said, you know, bring a change of clothes for both driving trips and flying trips. Like that's a no brainer. But I had to shout this one out because um, baby blowouts were always every single flight for my babies. And I flew with babies of all ages for a long time. And I I learned to bring at least a shirt for myself when I would pack the baby's spare clothes because spit up and poop. It was like a guarantee. It wasn't even an if, but a when. So um, that's one that you might not think of. You think of the babies and the toddlers and their change of outfits, but definitely think about yourself or at least think of a layer. Like you could take this layer off and stash yeah. it in a, in a bag and have another shirt underneath. So yeah. And I really never had that experience of flying with really little babies. The yeah. first, the youngest I ever flew with was a toddler. So um, that is smart. Uh, Valerie says, if you're flying with small kids who don't drink water well, bring powder packets of Pedialyte or lemonade. That is really smart because, yeah, not all little ones feel like having water, but uh, they really need to on those flights. Yeah, I have terrible water drinkers. Two out of the three don't really drink water well at all. And dehydrated kids are really grumpy, like worse than hungry kids or tired kids sometimes. So that's really smart. And it might be not something you would give them at home necessarily, or might right. have a little sugar yeah. or something, but yeah, stay hydrated. And you can go through security with that because it's not a liquid. So, Well, Sarah, I also believe that you admitted that you have a problem drinking on flights as oh, well. I, I'm a terrible hydrator in general, but yes, on Sunday, I disclosed that I don't really drink any liquids the whole time I'm flying. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should just eat powdered Pedialyte. I could just... <laughs> I, I could bring a little noon tablet. You I could love just, and you could noon. just nibble on yeah. it. <laughs> it's really weird. If you catch me doing that, I'm really like gone, <laughs> gone over the edge. Um, okay. This is such a good one from Alicia. And I, I must've read this somewhere uh, a few years ago. Cause I did it once. 
But the tip is to pack a beach ball or a few balloons, which are great for a rainy day game of indoor volleyball or whatever the kids make up. But here's the thing that's so smart. They they go in your suitcase at zero volume and they inflate to be like a pretty fun indoor toy like balloons. Right. They're so fun to bat around and safe, by the way. They're not going to knock over anything or like break grandma's lamp or whatever for the most part. So a pack of balloons that go in at zero, zero space taking up and then inflate to be a play thing is really, really smart. Um, I also was thinking that, you know, those play scarves that are just like great for make believe and like really lightweight, something like that too becomes uh, a really great play thing that takes up zero space. So I just love that efficiency. I love that. I admit when I first read that one, I thought she meant on bring them on the flight or in the car. And I was like, oh boy. (laughs) I'm just picturing like, have you ever had your kids playing with balloons yeah. in the back of your car yeah, while you're driving? Yeah. Oh, it's so stressful. Yeah. So no, no this is for when you've you gotten to Packing your destination. For later. Yeah, yeah. Got yeah. it. Got it. All right. We're all on the same page now. Um, okay. So Kristen says, bring night lights. You don't want anyone getting hurt adults or scared like kids as they try to maneuver an unfamiliar dark space when they get up to use the bathroom. And I, and I, I think that's so smart. And that's one of those things that like, I would never remember would be good until I was at the place. And then I'm like, oh, you know what we could really use right now? Yeah. A night light. Yeah. yeah. And it's another one of those things where the um, the cost benefit, the cost of space versus the benefit when you get there is so obvious because it just doesn't take, you could stick it in your purse on the, right. you know, on the way there. So I love that. And I had not thought of that one. Um, okay. Well, moving on. This next category is is still about stuff and what we're bringing, but it's a little bit more about where to put it and how to organize it, both for the journey and at the destination. Um, and a little bit about where to put the people, because, you know, often we're re- reshuffling our family. Where does everybody sleep? Where does everybody ride? So here were the top mentions that multiple people said. And the first one is laundry baskets. And this is one for road trips, because I don't know anybody who's brought a laundry basket <laughs> on an airplane. But in the back of your car, people had really creative uses for a regular laundry bin or a clear tub. Um, so basically just using using space wisely in the trunk of your car. It doesn't have to be suitcases like it does when you fly. Um, Ziploc bags, multi-purpose. Lots of people mentioned gallon Ziploc bags, clear bins. Also, a lot of votes for having each kid have their own small backpack starting pretty young. And I can definitely co-sign that one, especially for air travel, even two and three year olds can have one of those little mini backpacks where they have their water, their blankie, their book, whatever. And that's a great habit to start young. So those were the things that came up again and again. How about some specific tips, Megan? So Courtney suggests um, packing easy access extra clothes for everyone in a bag with wipes and somewhere to put dirty clothes. This is one that I think I finally learned over the years. Like, an extra plastic bag is a really good idea. It could just be a bag from the grocery store or whatever. Um, Nothing fancy, but it is nice to be able to separate out the dirty stuff from the clean stuff. She says even older kids and adults could have surprise car sickness issues. I would also argue, even if nobody gets sick, it's just nice to have a place to like, it's just nice to have that option. You might spill on yourself or a kid almost certainly will spill on themselves. And it's always nice to have a place to stick dirty clothes separate from the clean. Well, yeah. And it's, it's such a logical next step. If you're bringing changes of clothes, which I always did, you're going to have dirt. Like if someone is changing right. their clothes, they're going to be handing you some dirty clothes. And then to have the wipes all in that like same right. little operation is really smart. Very, very smart. I am, I am curious while we're on that topic. Um, what, when you're traveling with your kids, if it's not a situation where you're doing laundry on the road, or even if you are, Do you have a system for like where the dirty clothes go? It's usually uh, case specific, but if we're all in a hotel room, I will, or, or a guest room at a friend's house or something, I will declare a laundry pile area and I will inform everyone within like 10 minutes of getting there. Like as soon as we're unpacking, I, I say, okay guys, this is where the, this is where the dirty laundry goes. So it might be different each time, but I definitely think about it. How about you? Okay. Um, I would say if it's the kind of situation where everyone has their own luggage, I tell every like everybody has their own like little dirty laundry oh, yeah. receptacle and then it has a special place in their luggage. But okay. sometimes if we're like if it's just going to be a quick trip, sometimes I'll share a suitcase with Clara or, you know, the boys might share a suitcase if it's like not a very long trip. So in that case, I might have like even an extra big bag yeah. or suitcase to keep everyone's dirty clothes. So it kind of depends on like how long the trip is. 
how like is it summer or winter? Yeah. Because you know, if we're going somewhere in the winter, like those dirty clothes really take up a lot of space. Yeah. Yep. Well, so Danielle's next tip did come up a couple times with a couple different people, but the basic idea is when you have really little kids and you're packing for several days. Um, to assemble outfits ahead of time, including every piece of clothing to make the outfit, right down to socks, underwear, maybe there's a hat or a hair tie or something like that, everything. And then Danielle says to put a rubber binder around it. So I'm picturing like a big fat rubber band. Is that what you're picturing? Like oh, some, something like that? I was like having that? a hard time figuring out what a rubber binder is, but uh, maybe that's what she means. Yeah, I, that, I'm thinking. And then others have done the same with Ziploc bags or packing cubes. I have done this and I want to say the situation where it's most useful because some of you may be thinking like, that's a, that's a lot of overkill. I don't really care which outfit my kid wears, which day my kids know how to get themselves dressed. And so I will say I've done this both ways. Um, the times it's been really, really useful is when I have very small kids who don't dress themselves and I want other adults to be able to help me get kids ready in the morning. And when the nature of the trip is that it's not really like interchangeable outfits each day. That's happened to us when we've gone to like a family wedding and there's like certain days where kids need to be dressed nice. It's happened on trips where we're going to be like going on a boat or going (laughs) on a hike. So if, if you as the mom can think through it all at home and be like, right, okay, the Wednesday outfits need to look like this. It may sound a little controlling or a little overkill, but man, when you can hand um, a Ziploc bag to grandma or to somebody else and be like, can you get the baby dressed? Here you go. It's really, really uh, one of those high fives to your future self. Well, I'm going to I'm going to read Faith's because she's much more of the style that I would have been when I had little kids. Um, And I remember clearly not exactly this this system, but something very similar. So Faith says for car trips, we pack everyone's stuff in one big laundry basket. They have little ones. And we bring a second collapsible laundry basket to move the dirty clothes into. So it's basically like the exact opposite of um, the Sarah Danielle approach where all the work is done in advance. Yeah. This is more like keep it simple on the front and the back end, but like create more work for yourself in the middle, which yeah. I think is very on, on, uh, what's on point for me on personality for me. Um, but yeah, on brand is the word I was looking for, yeah. but yeah, but it always worked. It was very simple and, and not as much, um, not as much moving around of stuff when the kids were little, not as much like having to think everything through in the beginning, like, where might this need to be? Where that might that need to be? And then be being frustrated that it actually didn't turn out that way anyway. It was like the simplest system. So yeah, I think that so. was more the more the more the direction I probably would have gone in. Yeah, I think that's a plane versus car thing too because I just had yeah, such limited true. space uh, yeah, that we couldn't, couldn't overpack at all. In fact, right. we usually had to underpack and do laundry there and stuff like that. Um, okay, well, Sarah says, and this is more about where to put the people, not the stuff. Sarah says, use whatever space you have to give people the sleeping environment they need. And she says, all of my babies have slept in walk-in closets or the bathroom so that they're behind a closed door and can be in the dark and everyone sleeps better. And I would just co-sign that. And I have done all the closets and the laundry rooms and the bathrooms for pack and plays set up. Um, I also would like to remind everyone that you can move hotel furniture around within reason. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt the hotel room furniture. But I get weird, like a weird rebel rush out of going into a hotel room or like one of those extended stay stay suite type of places and just kind of being like, okay, this chair is not going to be needed. I'm going to put it all the way over here and the suitcase is going to go here. And like, we don't need a desk. So we're going to, this is now the changing table. And like, you can, you can probably be, uh, more invasive into that space and make it your own more than you think. Um, and that might support better sleep. It also just might, um, keep your kids safe and keep everybody feeling like this is your little home for a few days. So this is so funny because you know that I'm a rebel by nature Mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't think it ever has occurred to me to move hotel furniture. I think I'm a little afraid of what I'd find under it. Yeah, that that could be true. I've never moved a bed. (laughs) I have never moved a bed. But I've moved coffee tables or especially when you're in, I'm picturing those suites, you know, like the, they're inexpensive, but there's like a couple rooms. Um, I've definitely moved desks and coffee tables completely out of the way or converted them to something else. Um, you know, pushed aside chairs and reconfigured well, and sometimes things. You, yeah. if, if you have older kids who are using pullout beds, like in the suites, you kind of have to, like yes. they don't ever make those rooms. They're never laid out so that everything can stay where it is and actually function. Right. I'm just picturing like moving a big um, like seat, like a chair in the corner and finding that the legs have gone all the way down to the carpet because it's never been moved. <laughs> and there's like, I don't know, a whole family of mice living under yeah. it or something. I'm sure that's not the case in most hotels. Yeah. But yeah. Um, 
I think that's a good tip. Kind of funny just to imagine you like chuckling as you, you know, like it's a, like it's the Enneagram chuckle. one, like walking into a room and being like, I can improve this. I can make this better. Yep. Well, Allison, this is so smart. Um, and the kind of thing that I would totally forget to do and then later be like, man, I wish I'd done this. Yeah. So Allison says, take pictures of all IDs, passports, vaccination cards and other important documents. So you have a copy of them on your phone in case of emergencies. And I don't even know if some of those would even like if the digital would even count. Um, if you lost the hardcover or the hard copy, but it would just still feel good to have them. It might buy you some time. It might get right. you past one gatekeeper till you got to the next one to, you know, it might not let you get on an international flight or yes. something, but yeah, it's really smart. And I think since COVID digital proof of anything has gotten a little more like common and relaxed. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's really, really smart. Um, so Marianne is a longtime listener and she is also a travel agent. So I, I perked up when I saw that she had chimed in here. So her tip about where to put all the people is to try to book the biggest room you can afford when you have little kids so that when they nap, you have another place to go and don't have to tiptoe around them. Just a general tip to like, whatever your budget is, spend it on getting the space. Everybody needs to be comfortable. And I think that's a good tip. Um, I wanted to add to that. That if you are staying in a hotel, remember that rooms are almost always assigned to you at check-in. So you have a reservation. It's just like you can make a dinner reservation at a restaurant, but you're rarely going to know which table you get until you get there. And that's the same at a hotel. It's always worth asking what, what specific kind of rooms are available. And then even if it's possible or what it would cost to upgrade, because it's frustrating for a planner like me. Cause I always want to know that like ahead of time, like, Oh, does this room have a pullout couch or does this room like have room for a pack and play? And the best time to do that, unfortunately is when you get there, but you'd be surprised that there are often options to upgrade for not very much more money or just say like, Hey, the best type of room for us would be really far from the elevator or whatever, whatever mm -hmm. you're looking for. And you can get really lucky. Sometimes you don't, but sometimes you do. So don't be afraid to ask to get real granular about which room they're assigning you when you check in. I would add to that, that, um, and I'm trying to remember like what age it was when we all stopped sleep, like what age my kids were yeah. when we stopped sleeping in the same room with them and started getting adjoining rooms. Yeah. But I have very specific memories when we could afford it, even when we were sleeping in the same rooms with our kids of getting adjoining rooms so yeah. that they had a room to hang out and play in, uh -huh. or we would have one room that we would mess up. And then one room we'd sleep in yeah. um, or one room like the kids could nap in while the and especially if we were doing trips with um, other families. Like I have very specific memories of traveling with like my yeah. brother and Jenna's family and getting adjoining rooms. And then the adults would all hang out in one room and like play cards. Yeah. And the kids would just like bounce on the beds and watch TV in the other room. And then at night, the families would go to their own rooms and shut the door yeah. and we would all sleep like the family would all sleep in one room. But you could still spread out like spreading out as much as possible in hotels is is nice. Yeah. And it is even adjoining rooms because we're in that exact stage right now. And even adjoining rooms often they can't guarantee to you right. until you get there. So it's like, again, for the planners like me, suspend your need to know. But then once you get there, then really advocate for yourself. And of course, politely, but like see what they've got, because often you can get lucky if you don't just take the first thing that's offered. But but like. I guess, become an active participant in the assignment yes. of your room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and you've definitely, if you're, do, if you're using like um, a third party booker or doing it online, you almost certainly cannot guarantee right. an adjoining room. But if you call, sometimes they will, like okay. they will guarantee it to you on the phone. Oh, it's good. just when you start doing like the online or like, you know, using Priceline or whatever, yeah. which I love. It's just that sometimes when it just, you don't get the same choice yep. when you do that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so last one before our break. Emily says, for road trips, have a three-drawer plastic bin in the back. Have one drawer dedicated to a change of clothes and diapers, uh, one drawer for snacks and paper products, and one drawer for your first aid kit, quicker toys that you might want to get to, then label the drawers so everyone knows what's in there. I could totally see that, like, at the back of the minivan yeah. or, like, station wagon. It, like, pops, you know, you pop it open, and then you've basically got a bedroom. Yes. And this is sort of like takes the laundry basket or the clear plastic tub tip to the next level. And when Emily said this, a couple of people were like, don't the drawers tip over or do they come open when you drive? And she said, nope, not if you have like heavier stuff in there at the bottom to weigh it down. So and then that labeling tip is so key because if mom is the only person who knows where the things are, mm -hmm. mom is not having as fun of time on this exactly. family trip. So I love that one. 
Sarah, this isn't exactly breaking news, but I'm just going to say it. Comfy clothes are here to stay. Uh, yes. Okay. I am here for this. I mean, I was already on the cozy train even before COVID, but now I'm like, give me all the stretchy waistbands and soft fabrics, but they still need to be cute, right? Well, obviously. And you're in luck, Sarah, because our partner Fabletics has the most stylish activewear. Seriously, I love their pretty colors, fun prints, and fashionable details. And right now we can get our listeners a fab list deal uh -huh, <laughs> of two bottoms for just $24 when they become VIP members. A VIP subscription is a great way to build that workout wardrobe or replace your worn out leggings with Fabletics best selling version. And you can always skip a month if it's not in your budget. Yeah, I love how flexible that is. And listeners, just click our special link from the show notes or head to themomhour.com slash Fabletics to get that special deal. That's themomhour.com slash Fabletics for fashionable activewear for everyone. Megan, today we're talking about our partner Minted, which is one of my favorite places to shop for gifts. I feel like people think of holiday cards and maybe framed photos when they think of Minted, but it's actually a marketplace for independent artists who create all kinds of things, home decor, table linens, journals and stationery, and original art. Well, I'm glad you reminded me of this, Sarah, because I think I'm guilty of forgetting to check back in with Minted to see what kind of new, unique home accents and gifts they might have. They have accent furniture, tabletop decor, and all kinds of art. When you shop their site, you get to learn all about the original artists and their backgrounds and stories, almost like shopping an incredibly well-curated craft fair, but online. And listeners, when you use our special link, you can help support the Mom Hour and an independent artist and a really incredible company all at the same time. Visit themomhour.com slash minted, a special page on our site where we've both picked some minted products we're eyeing right now, plus some great deals for you. Again, that's themomhour.com slash minted. All right. So this whole section, Megan, is like probably some of the smartest tips that came through, honestly, because it's like the type of thing you learn after doing this a few a few times. It's kind of a catch all category that's like, what can we do ahead of time to save hassle later or what little things, what little actions can pay off big later, I guess. So we're talking about yeah. efficiency. We're talking about timing um, and we're talking about those high fives to our future self. Um, the top mention by far was so many people talked about doing like a shipped or Instacart or target pickup or whatever kind of delivery ahead of their arrival with specific grocery items, food and essentials. And it made me kind of realize like my age a bit because I used to pre-order Amazon like diapers. I used to send diapers ahead to my in-laws house, but that was like when Amazon was a couple of days and that was something I would do like a few days in advance. What these moms are talking about is like a really targeted grocery delivery where you, mm -hmm. you can do it. Like you can pick the exact half hour window to know that you're going to have coffee delivered right when you need it on yep. the day you arrive. Like it's really granular. And, and that's the part that does not occur to me. We were just at Disney and it took me three days to realize like, oh, you can probably DoorDash to a hotel now. I had never done that. Like I've I've ordered food delivery to a house, but I, for some reason, thought they wouldn't allow it at the hotel till we finally asked. And they were like, oh, yeah, they had a whole system for So the world has changed and I am yeah. catching up, everyone. So the number one tip that was mentioned by so many people is being really targeted and granular about whatever it is, whether it's groceries for an Airbnb where you're staying, whether it's diapers and essentials, but like having it either there waiting for you or arriving within a few hours of you to alleviate that stress of unpacking and settling in. So my mind was blown. Well, I, I don't necessarily think this is your age, Sarah. I think it's also um, that you just don't, as a rule, use like shipped and Instacart very much. No, I don't. I, I don't yeah. And I think if you're in the habit of using it, then it's just in your head that that's an option. So I've used shipped um, and Instacart both while traveling. I've also many times ordered shipped groceries while 30,000 feet in the air for my family. Yeah to get I remember their that. groceries delivered while, you know, while I'm flying home from a trip. And then when I get home, I've, I've actually done that for pizza too. I've done a lot of like ordering <laughs> food for my family when I am not even in the same state <laughs> or like not even on the ground. Um, or like one of my very favorite things would be to get home from a trip back when I used to do so much traveling and like walk up and my groceries are on the porch Yeah, and I just pick them up and bring them in. Or sometimes I'd call my kids and be like, mom's going to be home in an hour bring the groceries yeah. in and put them away before I get there. So I just think when you're in the habit yeah. of using those, um, 
those tools, it just occurs to you that, oh, this isn't just for my home. Right. This is for everywhere. Yeah. 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 Amazing. So and all cool. of you have all figured it out. Just not me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're getting there. You're getting there. There was also quite a few mentions, and you alluded to this earlier, Megan, about strategically packing dirty laundry at the end of a trip to make the unpacking easier. And people had different strategies for this, and I've done it different ways. But I guess the general top tip is to think about that dirty laundry and how it affects your life when you get home. Like, yes, you know, some something. Yeah. Well, and if and if you don't like I've had, you know, early in my days um, as a traveling mom. I would think, well, when I get home, I'm going to remember what's dirty and what's cleaner. It's going to be obvious because like the dirty stuff, it's not folded. It's not. And when you get home, it's like one bad, you know, apple spoiling the bunch. Uh Yes. yes, Like you've got like the little skid marked underwear still stuck in the pants, like thrown in with everything else. I'm like, I guess I'll just wash everything then. We've all done that. Yes, exactly. So yes, be strategic, even though that might look a little different every time. Yeah. So um, first specific tip comes from Stephanie, and she says, for little kids, get the sleep environment ready first before any other unpacking occurs. You don't want an overtired child with no place to sleep. And I actually think that's brilliant on a couple levels. One being you also don't want any child in any stage of tiredness to think the whole hotel room or space like Airbnb is all play. Yeah. Like, and then Ooh, to yeah. get that into their minds and they're bouncing off the walls and they're jumping everywhere and they're jumping on the beds. And you're like, well, like if you walk in and, and already have, even if it's like one bed, you don't go on unless it's nap time or whatever. It's like creating that sleep environment. First thing plants that idea, the seed in their minds that that is where sleep is going to happen. So just don't mess it. Like, don't, you know, yes, when you're sleepy, that's where you go. But also when you're not sleepy, we don't, don't go, go like, yeah. don't go there. Don't go snack on that bed or whatever it is. Yes. That's yeah. so smart. And I know a lot of our traveling moms are bringing things now like white noise machines or baby monitors. So like you're going to have to think through things like outlets and lighting and those if you're doing like some darkening the room situation. And so if all that happens first, it allows you to use the rest of the space accordingly. So right. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Well, Leah said to rent the big stuff like cribs and high chairs or whatever you need at your destination. She recommends a company called Baby Quip. And I know Sarah, who's a a writer on our contributor team, has a blog post coming up this week about staying at a hotel with a baby. And she also recommended Baby Quip. I'm not familiar with that company, but I know there are equipment rental um, outlets in lots of cities for lots of different things. Have you ever used one like that, Megan? Um, No, I was just I was trying to think if that had ever been a thing I'd done. But no, I don't think I think this is an air travel thing, too. Like if you're, you know. I, traveling with a lot of babies and toddlers across the country on an airplane, you're not bringing pack in place. You're not bringing, right. you might be bringing a car seat and checking it. And we did that. You might be gate checking your stroller. Um, but the internet has made all this stuff so much easier to, to procure at the other end. So we will link right. up that uh, baby quip. It sounds like a popular one. It's really smart. And I think for us, when we were doing that kind of travel, usually there was a family on the other end right. where we'd be staying with and they might have the necessities like grandma would have, you know, a pack and play or high chair or whatever. Um, Or we were just making do because I didn't know this existed. So that's really cool. Um, Oh, Kimberly says, this is the part I always forget. I need to pack for myself first or at least leave enough time to pack for myself. (laughs) So I could totally see like blowing all your time, getting really granular with like how you're packing for your kids and like really acing it and then being like, oh no, all I have time to do now is throw a bunch of crap in a bag for myself. Yes. I, I am guilty of that. And it's also just kind of the mental load. You run out of ability to care, you know, yeah. you know what's to give. Um, and so that you end up like not really thinking through your own packing, which can be kind of a bummer on the other end. You're like, yeah. oh, this isn't like I didn't do this right for myself. So, well, Cassie, who is a listener of ours who has five kids like you, Megan, she says always, always, always build in rest time. And she's talking about when you plan your actual like time yeah. on your trip. So a break in each day or even a full day or two of doing practically nothing, especially when you have young kids, the kids need it, but so do the parents. And she says, it took me years to figure out that was the secret to having a really enjoyable vacation. Love that. And that is like advice we could use basically every day, right? (laughs) Build in rest. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Rest doesn't go away just because you're not home anymore. Um, And I know we all want to cram in as much fun as we possibly can when we're traveling, but it there's a uh, diminishing returns. Yes. Um, and at some point you can't have any, you can't have any more fun unless you stop for a little bit. Yep. 
So earlier in the episode, we talked a little bit um, about putting outfits together, but Katie has a tip that's really like takes it to the next level because it's basically bringing the family's outfits all together by day. So this is a lot of front end work, um, probably more than I ever would have put in myself, but I can totally see the benefits to that. So Katie says, packing outfits always seems to be one of the most stressful parts for me. I put everyone's clothes for each day in packing cubes. So I can grab the Tuesday bag and have appropriate clothes for everyone ready to roll. It helps us get out the door in the morning during trips to not have to think through outfits for everyone. Yeah, I love that. And I I do think we talked, we touched on it earlier on the outfit by outfit, but this is literally like the whole family per day. And right. I think it is for those who maybe gain a sense of peace of mind by thinking through this before you leave. Um, I think this could be a really good strategy. And I mentioned those types of trips, some types of trips really do call for this. And it's usually where you're doing something outfit specific that day. So like you don't want your four-year-old pulling out the outfit you were going to wear to like the special wedding and wearing it earlier in the week. You can't have that. So yeah, love it. Well, and I think too, that you can take kind of like a a half and half approach like that. Definitely. If I was traveling for a wedding or some kind of a special event, I would often compart like, like batch together everyone's clothes for that day. Like Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, um, the wedding breakfast is in this cube or bag or whatever. And the wedding itself is in this one. And then everything else is just all together and everyone grabs and goes. So I think you can kind of mix and match depending on like what level of um, control, I guess you want to have over what everyone's wearing every day of the week, or if it's just important that they have certain things that get set aside. Yeah, totally. Um, I, this is a little sidebar, but I just want to say out loud that my kids became very, very good travelers because we did so much. Um, it wasn't a lot of vacations as we've discussed. We, I think we talked about in our FOMO episode, but it was often going to see family and they, as they got older, became really good at asking me like, okay, what are we going to be doing on this trip? How cold, what's the weather going to be like? Mm -hmm. What kind of shoes am I going to need? So just a little note of encouragement for those who are putting in the hard work of thinking through outfits, thinking through weather, um, if you model that and if you're like just by sh- just by showing your kids and doing it, um, you're going to have helpers eventually. And not all kids, I think. Care that much about what they mm-hmm. wear on any given day, but I've been pleasantly surprised at how logical my kids are now about like, OK, how many pairs of underwear am I going to need? Are we going swimming while we're there? Um, how cold is it going to be? And they ask these questions because they kind of understand how to pack. So just to like there's light at the end of that tunnel. Well, there is, and that you also will get to a point where certain kids, I mean, not all kids are going to be this way, but where they take ownership over their not caring. So I have at least one, possibly two kids in my family um, who got to a point where they would say, okay, do I need my swim trunks? Do I need, like, they would say like, what do I need? And then all they would wear the rest of the time was pajamas (laughs) because to them, it wasn't worth track, like keeping track of other clothes. It wasn't worth it. They were like, we're not going anywhere. So I don't care. I'm just going to stay in pajamas. I'm like, well, do you want several pairs of pajamas? They were like, no, I'll just, I'll be good in one. I'm like, okay, well, you're, please bring more underwear. Yeah. I don't even yeah. know if you're going to put them on. Just yeah. bring them. So like they almost start to gauge for themselves, like their care meter. Yeah. When like how, how light or heavy do they want to pack? And I would say for us, that was like a 11, 12 okay. year old type yeah. of thing where they started to really kind of take ownership of that, which is fun. Yeah. So. I love it. Okay. Well, this tip from Madison is very much about like using time and uh, the passage of time to your advantage and for efficiency when it serves you. And she says, travel at night. She says, we always leave when my husband gets off work. We eat sandwiches in the car for dinner and just go, go, go. I nap and he drives until about one or 2 AM. Then I drive for a couple hours until I get tired. Then we park safely in a grocery store, parking lot or gas station, someplace safe and sleep in the car until the sun comes up and the kids wake up. We're a little sleepy the first day of the trip, but we saved money by not getting at a getting a hotel and the kids sleep schedule stays intact by not having them like slumber in the car all day on the road. Um, and I this brought me right back to my childhood because we used to do 15 hour drives from Santa Barbara up to central Oregon and we always did it all night long. The difference was my dad would drive the whole night and he could do it. He He would caffeinate and he would. But I have these memories of like waking up like, I I don't know. And I don't know if he would like be stopping, but I'd wake up and we'd all kind of wake up and then we'd go back to sleep. And then he would be so tired the next day. So yeah. I think they, I think my parents stopped doing it because it sounds like Madison and family have a little better trade-off or a way for like neither parent to have a total all-nighter. 
Um, but we did it a lot and it's like, it saves a ton of money on a hotel. It gets you to where you are going. Literally. It's like the red eye version of a road trip. Um, and it's yeah. brutal. It can be brutal on adult on adults, but if you're young and fit and healthy and you can do it, <laughs> there's a lot of benefits. So, well, this was basically how we did all of our travel for the first, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years of having kids. Like we would plan it. We didn't even bother usually with the stopping and sleeping. We would literally plan the trip so that we would leave at whatever time we could drive through the night and get to where we were going about four or 5 a.m. And then um, John and I would sleep. Um, the mm -hmm. kids would still have a couple hours left in them. My, and I had kids who would sleep longer. So yeah. that was helpful. Um, and then we would just get going. And I would say that worked until we were about 30. Yeah. <laughs> And then it did not work anymore. I don't know if it's like, again, it's like 30 was about the age I stopped sleeping on people's sofas. Yeah. I don't know if it was like, I can't anymore, or I just realized I never wanted to. And it's like the financial trade-off wasn't worth it or yeah. something anymore. So it was like, it worked when it worked. And then, yeah. and then it just didn't work. And that's fine. Like if it works for you and you can, like people do all kinds of adventurous things that, um, work when they're doing them because it just like the trade-off is worth it. Totally. Absolutely. And yeah. I do have sweet memories uh, as a kid. One, I remember being so excited about after school because we'd leave almost right after school. So I'd be at school that day knowing I'm getting in a car for like, and tomorrow I'm going to be in Oregon. And so I'd be so excited. And then the other part I remember is waking up at like five in the morning at like a truck stop diner yes. in uh, Southern Oregon and knowing like, okay, we still have three or four hours to go, but we get to have breakfast and then we get to be awake and watch the sun come up and then we're going to be at grandma and grandpa. So I do as a kid, I really have mostly good memories of those drives. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I, I think there is something, you know, as a kid, I also grew up with doing a lot of those kinds of trips and there is something about waking that's very snug about like waking up, you know, all snuggled up in your seat with your siblings yeah. and like your pillow and your book or whatever. And opening your eyes and like seeing bright lights and wondering, where am I? Yeah. You know, where am I? Um, okay. So this one's from Allison. She says, if you're flying with littles and you have more than one adult in the group, send one adult to board early or get your luggage conveniently in the overhead bins and to set up car seats. And then the other adults take the kids onto the plane at the very last minute to maximize energy burning time or running around the airport or just minimize time sitting on the airplane waiting. And that probably also depends on what kind of boarding situation you have. I've done another version of this too, where like, one of us and this with works with older kids um, as well, or even just two adults, like one checks in and gets all the baggage checked while the other one's parking. Yeah, that's like, a mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes like getting through security with the kids can sometimes be good. And like maybe the other adult is dealing with something different mm -hmm. that like both are equally important. And it, if you don't need all hands on deck for like both parts, yeah. because your kids are old enough or self-sufficient enough, that can be a good way to use time so you don't get there too early or like, I don't know just kill time in the airport. Yeah. And I, if you have like toddlers and you're flying, I would agree that if someone can keep them off the airplane until the very last minute, I'm a little bit annoyed with myself that I didn't, I don't think we did this when we were flying with really little kids. I think we just boarded with our group and you know, I mean, that's a good 30 minutes that you're sitting on the plane right. before it takes off. So Allison pro tip. I don't think I did that. And everyone else should, if you've got, if you've got two adults and someone can stay in the terminal with the kids until the last minute. That's super smart. Well, Jillian, this is the the tip that keeps on giving, Megan. I'm not going to say that Jillian got this advice from you, but it is something you wrote about years ago that we still hear about. So Jillian says, we just did Disney World and the single most genius thing I did because we had to be on a bus to the parks by 7, 10 a.m. was put the kids to bed in their clothes for the next day. It's the tip that keeps on giving. <laughs> Well, and it's the tip that if you're, you know, one of my kids, they just like latched onto and now yeah. they won't get out of those clothes. Right. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> he got actually shouted uh, out. He, he did. He did. He wouldn't care because he, he knows it's true. Um, okay. So Tammy says on the way home, put all the dirty clothes in one suitcase and everything else into another. Drop the suitcase full of dirty clothes in the laundry room right from the car. I have done that and it is like mind-blowingly like free, freeing. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Love yeah, it. Great. Um, and then also, lastly, also on the laundry, Rebecca said, do laundry before returning home. So if you're at an apartment or Airbnb, or even if you have a laundromat nearby, um, they, they have pickup and delivery service for cheaper than the hotel. But just to go home with clean clothes in your suitcase, if that's an option, is a game changer, according to Rebecca. So. I have done that, too. And I will also say that going to the laundromat with a book and a coffee is a great way for mom to... Do something really important uh -huh. while also not being around 
the family for a little yeah. bit. Great. You're Great. needing a break. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Okay, well, our last section is if all of these aforementioned hacks and tips have failed, you still hopefully have some control over the way you approach the situation and your mindset. So these last tips are really in that much more like emotional space um, of reminding each other that the way we look at a family trip uh, makes a huge difference in how much we enjoy it. So in terms of the things that came up again and again, the biggest one was just reframing this idea that this is not a vacation. It's not a vacation to travel with young kids. And that's not like selling our kids short or anything. It's just that the word vacation implies rest, recharge, right. relaxation, leisure. And being with little kids is never that. Exactly. Really. <laughs> so so yeah. reframing it, and a lot of people called it, this is a family trip. Some people said this is an adventure, which I thought that was like a nice reframe. Um, but just letting go of the idea that you're going to come back from this feeling like you got a break because that's not probably going Something to be Something else is for it. We'll get you that. Not this. This isn't for that. <laughs> exactly. So that was a yeah. thing that came up again and again. And then we we have some specific comments that I think are worth, you know, worth shouting out from different people. So, yeah. So Mary says, just slow down, do less, take breaks to nap, go on a walk, whatever recharges your family. Just circling back to the idea that like trying to cram things in actually does the reverse of what you hope it will do. Mm -hmm. Like there is that point where you will have less and less fun the more you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Diminishing returns. Um, Cassie, again, who has five kids, said let go of the idea of a perfect vacation because with little ones, there is no perfect. There will be tears, diaper blowouts, meltdowns, and possibly delayed flights, flat tires, and more. That's okay. And if you can accept it as part of the experience and adventure, everything will feel easier and everyone will be happier. One bad moment or bad day does not a bad vacation make unless you let it. Cassie, I feel like you're talking to like 32 year old Sarah with three small kids. And I wish that you'd had those words for me then. Cause yeah, this is, this is hard for me. Like the, it's the letting go of expectations or the letting go of how things are supposed to go is a struggle for some of us. Madeline says it's absolutely OK to try and stick to your regular schedule. And it is also fine to modify it for your vacation. Just do its easiest. I love that because we get so much advice about like why you should let it all go or why you should, you know, stick to nap routines and everything else. And it really depends a lot on your kids and where you're going and why yeah. you're going and like what happens on the trip. So what's easiest to do that? I love yeah. getting permission to do either one. I mean, that is almost like the tagline for a family vacation. Just do what's easiest, like forget the rest and do the thing that is easiest for you. Um, Jill says, be willing to not do something or to cancel something. Basically, someone will be tired and you need to be flexible. That museum with a crying three-year-old is not going to be fun just skip it. So it's similar to do less and take breaks, but this is almost giving you permission to really opt out, even if it was something you paid for, even if it was something you planned, even if it means splitting right. up the family and someone staying back to nap with the kid who hasn't had a nap in three days. So just basically be willing to cancel something. Yeah. Yep. Um, Valerie says, take a deep breath and don't sweat the small stuff. I try to pick my battles in general, so I'm not seemingly constantly nagging my kids but I really broaden my tolerance when traveling. I pretty much only pick the battles that jeopardize safety. So I love it knowing like, like we like to say what hills you're going to die on yeah. and limiting that number of hills. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that comment kind of reminded me of you, Megan. Like, I feel like that's your, you're already not, I mean, you already don't sweat a lot of the small stuff and you try and pick your battles and then on vacation, you just up even that less. even, even more. And I like <laughs> yep. that Valerie was like, basically if it doesn't jeopardize your safety, it's probably fine. So I love it. Um, Alicia said, so many people stress about their baby crying on the plane. It's important to keep this in mind. It is public transportation and babies are a part of the public. Babies fuss sometimes. Thinking this way will lower your stress and that alone will calm your baby because they will sense your tension. I've, I actually hadn't really ever framed it that way of public transportation. Um, and but I, I certainly have always felt like babies are humans and right. humans on airplanes sometimes don't act their best. And that for sure goes for adults. So why shouldn't a baby or a toddler get to have kind yeah. of a rough day? Yeah. Well, and and I always think of it this way, like when I'm on a plane and there's a baby crying, I'm a, it's always and I'm again, this is someone I'm someone who's had five babies. And so I babies crying is something I'm very used to. But I'm always surprised by how little it can bother me because the plane's already really loud. Like planes are already making loud sounds all the time. And so babies crying kind of just becomes part of that background hum. And then I have earbuds. Yeah. Congratulations to you. Yeah. I get to put them in my ears whenever I want. Or 
people can bring their noise canceling headphones on. Like we're we're only entitled to the comfort of our own seat on a plane. Yeah. We're not really entitled to have anything outside of our seat go our way. And so like I think that that's just a really important thing to yeah. point out. Um Neha says lower your expectations. We try to have one goal per day and then whatever happens happens with the rest of it. And I love that. It's kind of like along the same lines of like let go of the things that aren't going right or yeah. just be willing to cut something out of the day and yeah. keep it really simple. But just like one goal a day, you, you could probably make that. Yeah. And then everything else is whatever it is. All bonus. Um, and finally, Amanda reminds us that kids are usually more resilient than I estimate they will be. We try to make arrangements that we think will be best, bring along items we think they'll need. And in the end, I remind myself that they're probably going to do just fine and be more flexible than I'm inclined to give them credit for. And that is, again, a very like Sarah centric comment, because I spent a lot of time thinking about what would happen if my kids were off their routines, if they didn't get a nap and um, I didn't give them as much credit as I should have for, you know, how flexible and resilient they are, including like a couple terrible meltdown days that you do eventually bounce back from when yeah. you get home. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, sometimes that. it just happens no matter how careful you are about their routines or how good a parent you are or whatever, like right. that stuff is just. Well, these were such great tips and we had so much fun putting this together. Hopefully helpful for those of you listening. Yeah, just some things that are coming up. Um, first of all, we know we're coming up on summer and right now this is the time that we're starting to think about some of the things that our kids might do this summer, like go to a day camp or maybe a sleepaway camp or do you start to sleepovers? And there's that kind of like um, point of tension between the things that maybe you think your child's ready for and they don't agree or the mm -hmm. things that they think they're ready for and you're not sure. And just like that move towards summer independence. So we have a special episode coming up this Friday that's all about just kind of fostering that independence while I guess honoring where you are mm -hmm. with it. Um, or where your child may be with it. So that's a special episode. You can listen to this Friday. Yeah, we're excited about that one. And then as a reminder, we're putting all of our travel content this spring on a special page at themomhour.com slash travel22. It includes older episodes you might have missed. It includes new episodes like this one. And it includes a ton of great blog content by our contributor team, really digging into the nitty gritty of what to pack, where to put everybody, like how to stay sane. We have so much already. And then that's a page that will keep growing as we move through spring and summer. So we will link it up in the show notes. Megan, this was really fun. We'll talk to everybody soon. Talk to you soon. Bye.